Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Swedish furniture giant IKEA continues its push into consumer electronics, but its latest smart speaker holds quite the secret. I previously reviewed IKEA's Symphonisk bookshelf speaker. It was designed in collaboration with Sonos and works within that company's ecosystem of products. A few things about its hardware made me curious, so this time we'll take a look at what's going on inside it. It's worth noting that while we're looking at the bookshelf version of the speaker, I'm fairly confident that many of the conclusions we'll draw also apply to the lamp version that IKEA also sells. The two operate the same way and sound almost the same. The speaker's enclosure is made entirely of plastic. There's the AC input socket and Ethernet port on the back, but Symphonisk lacks any analog audio inputs. All audio needs to be streamed to it over the network. The front grille is removable by pulling on the tag at the top, and it's made up of a plastic frame with fabric covering. If you wanted, you could replace this fabric with your own to better match your decor. And the front bezel has very simple controls, just volume and play pause buttons. The speaker is on all the time, so there's no power switch. Disassembly is straightforward once you figure it out. The screws are hidden underneath these rubber inserts that hold in the grill. After they're out, you can pull the front bezel free, but not too far as there's wires connecting it to the back of the speaker. Right away, something that caught my eye was this foam tape around the outside. It's used to help seal the enclosure for better bass response, but it's the exact same tape and applied in the same way as IKEA's Enemy speaker. I tore that one down in a previous video, and this won't be the only time we see some similarities between the two. Attached to the front bezel is that button board, which is connected to a flat flex ribbon cable that's been taped to the bottom of the case to keep it from rattling around. In fact, lots of attention has been paid to the cable arrangement. All of them are wrapped in foam tape and either held in by brackets or hot glued into place. Symphonisk uses a two-way speaker design with a 1-inch soft dome tweeter and 3-inch woofer. The Enneby speaker uses what appear to be off-the-shelf drivers from a manufacturer called Gugong Electric Company, or GGEC. It's likely you've never heard of them, but you've probably heard the products it builds. They provide components and final assembly for a number of well-known brands, the list of which they don't disclose. The labels on the back of the drivers in Symphonisk look different, but they contain a similar string of numbers to the drivers in Enneby. The drivers also visually appear identical between the two, so I think it's reasonable to say that GGEC makes the speakers that Symphonisk uses. There's a front-mounted acoustic port, but I was surprised to see a lack of batting inside the enclosure. It helps with bass performance, and there's some inside Enneby, but apparently Symphonisk's designers decided it wasn't necessary for whatever reason. Tucked into the back is a single main circuit board with a few sets of wires running to it. First is the AC input for the built-in power supply, and next is the four pin connector that routes to the speakers. There are two antenna boards on the opposite end of the housing. They're for Wi-Fi and they face different directions in order to get omnidirectional coverage. Their leads connect to what looks like an ordinary mini PCIe wireless card. A big blob of hot glue secures the connectors, so I decided to just remove the whole card without disconnecting the cables. Even though there are two torque screws that secure it, the Wi-Fi card is still held down with some hot glue. Popping off the RF shield shows an Atheros AR9580 chipset, which indeed connects through PCIe and supports 802.11n. This particular version of the chip only supports Wi-Fi, so that's perhaps one reason why this speaker doesn't support Bluetooth audio. The main board is held in with a few screws. 
The flat flex cable to the front panel is difficult to remove with the board in place, so I carefully peeled it from the housing so I could disconnect it. The board is double-sided, and once it's taken out, it reveals a decently large passive heatsink screwed into the back of the case. The board has two main sections. One side has the components for the power supply, and the other side is for the processing and amplification circuitry. I was disappointed to see that low-quality capacitors are being used. Capson is far from being the best available, and their use is a good indicator of where IKEA had to cut corners in order to meet a price point. You can expect to have to replace these in a few years, especially if the speaker is plugged in all the time as intended. Under the top RF shield is a few chips, three of which are interesting. The first is a Maxim Ethernet controller. This is what powers the network jack on the back and only goes up to 100 megabit. Gigabit isn't really necessary considering the relatively small amount of bandwidth the speaker requires for streaming audio. That chip connects to the brains of the operation, an IMX 6 series processor from NXP. It features two CPU cores in one package an ARM Cortex-A9 running at 1 GHz, and a Cortex-M4 at 227 MHz. The series of chips it belongs to is advertised specifically as being good for multimedia applications, and indeed this one seems well suited for its use here. It has a PCIe 2.0 interface for connecting to the Wi-Fi card, as well as a few flavors of serial connections, including SPI and I2C, for things like that front panel button board. What's also interesting is that this chip features an analog to digital converter. Symphonisk doesn't have any built-in microphones for voice control, but other Sonos products do, so this is another sign of cost cutting. But it also hints at the true origins of the speaker. Next to the processor is a 256 megabyte DDR3 RAM chip from Nanya. That doesn't sound like a lot of RAM, but remember that this is a purpose-built device, so no doubt the OS and code it runs was designed to be efficient. And just adjacent to the RF shield is a PCM5101A chip from Texas Instruments. This is the speaker's DAC. It takes two-channel digital audio from the CPU and passes it along to the amplifier section as analog. That two-channel audio isn't stereo, though. It's mono. Instead, each channel handles low and high frequencies separately. The CPU splits the audio for the woofer and tweeter digitally, so a passive crossover network isn't needed. The CPU also performs some digital signal processing and EQ to try to get the speaker to sound better. On the opposite side of the board are fewer parts. Prying up the shield reveals a Winbond 256 megabyte flash storage chip for holding the speaker's operating system. The RF shield itself also serves a second purpose. It's used to couple the CPU to the heatsink we looked at earlier. It's certainly not going to be very efficient at it. Since the processor is on the other side, it relies on conducting heat through the PCB. But ARM-based chips are generally pretty efficient, so while it's not an ideal setup, I suspect it works okay. The last chip of interest is maybe the most important one, and it's the amplifier. Perhaps it comes as no surprise that it's a familiar part, a Texas Instruments TPA3116. It's a two-channel Class D design, and it's nice to see that it's coupled to the heatsink. This is important since it's being fed 24 volts from the power supply, so it's theoretically capable of hitting its 50 watt per channel maximum as unlikely as that may be through normal usage. And because the speaker is mono and the CPU is doing the work of a crossover, each channel on the amp goes directly to the woofer and tweeter separately. Seeing the word Sonos silkscreened on the board got me wondering who was responsible for designing which parts of the speaker. What I found proved quite interesting. I started by searching for teardowns of other Sonos speakers, and came across one on iFixit for the Play 1. Take a look at the drivers. Seem familiar? 
The woofer is the same size as the one used in Symphonisk, and while the tweeter is slightly smaller in the Play 1, it visually appears similar, like it's from the same product line. And the labels on the back have a striking resemblance, too. If that's not enough to draw conclusions from, a look at the circuit board should remove any doubt. It appears identical to that of the one inside Symphonisk. Digging through the FCC filing for the Play 1 shows that a few of the chips are different, namely the processor. It's an MPC8314 series chip from NXP, and it's based on the PowerPC platform. But the FCC filing is from 2014 when the Play 1 originally launched, and underneath the shield on my newer Play 1 is the same processor as we saw in Symphonisk. I found a mention that Sonos had switched to ARM-based processors in the Play 1 around 2017, so the FCC filing is simply outdated. In short, I think it's reasonable to conclude that IKEA's Symphonisk is more or less a Sonos Play 1 in a different enclosure. They have the same circuit boards and their driver components are very similar. But that also raises the question of the relationship between Symphonisk and Enneby. That is to say, did Sonos design it too? I actually don't think so. While Enneby is constructed in a very similar manner and uses similar if not the same speaker drivers, its circuit board is designed differently. My Enneby teardown video goes into the details, but in short, it has a completely different architecture in terms of how it handles audio. But I do think it's pretty clear that both speakers are manufactured by the same company likely GGEC. And there's a good chance they manufacture at least the Play 1 as well, if not the entirety of Sonos product line. Now given that the Play 1 sells for $150 US and Symphonisk is only $100, why would Sonos even agree to this arrangement? I can think of two main reasons. First, it helps bring more people to the Sonos ecosystem. If you like the bookshelf speakers, maybe you'll buy the higher price soundbar too. And second, it's because Sonos still makes money. I don't know how the business relationship between them and IKEA is set up exactly, but it's very likely Sonos gets a cut of the profits off of every Symphonisk sold. IKEA is interested in selling it because, one, there wasn't much work for them to do since Sonos did the hard part of designing the electronics, and two, even if its margins are low, it brings people into IKEA stores who likely also buy other, higher margin items. Like, for example, the $20 Symphonisk mounting bracket that probably cost a dollar to make. Ultimately, it's a win-win situation for both companies but also for consumers too. If you've been interested in picking up a Play 1 and don't care about the difference in form factor, you can save a decent amount of money by just buying a Symphonisk instead. If you liked the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.